Thank you, dear brother Pavel. Yes, you did tell me that, that uh, John Stott apparently stood here on more than one occasion. So, yes, I could have worn actually his tie. I have one of the ties of John Stott, but I, this is a different one. But uh, there we are. It is good to be here uh, and to share this wonderful occasion. It's good to come back to the uh, Czech Republic, to Prague. I've been here a few times before. And it's also been a special joy to meet again with some of our Langham scholars, including Pavel himself, uh, and various others from around the region. That's always a joy to, to do that. Now, we're here today, as we've heard, to celebrate uh, the completion and the launch of this Central and Eastern European Bible Commentary, a one-volume commentary on the whole Bible, the whole Bible, not just a whole book of the Bible, not even just the whole of the New Testament, but the whole Bible. And how good is that? The whole Word of God, the Scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, every Scripture, as the Apostle Paul put it, that has been inspired by God and is profitable for teaching and training people of God. The whole Bible, authoritative, relevant, living, and active. All of it explained, interpreted, made clear, thought through in the context and the language, and given to the region. What a glorious gift this is. And as Taya was saying, it's not only a gift to the believers and the churches of this great continent of Europe, it's also a gift from Europe to the global church. For today, as Taya was reminding us, more than ever, we need the voices of all God's people sharing their insights, their understanding of the Word of God in all its ancient power and contemporary relevance. And how badly we need that Word. We need the whole Bible because the world, the whole world, is an old mess, isn't it? Whether we look at the wider global context or our own European context in particular. We could go through a whole catalogue of global evils, folly, brokenness, violence, suffering. It's simply beyond computation or imagination. Just one country's width to the east of where we're sitting, there is the almost inconceivable destruction and devastation going on in Ukraine. And not far away from that, there are the thousands upon thousands of deaths and bereavements and rubble in the earthquakes of Turkey and northern Syria. And then, of course, there's also all the forgotten places, or at least those places that get so quickly forgotten from the fast-moving Western media and news cycles. The floods just a little while ago in Pakistan, a third of the country underwater. The famine in Somalia. Civil wars in Myanmar and Yemen. Economic and political collapse in Lebanon. Anarchy in Haiti. Repression in Afghanistan, Western China, the ongoing war that we've long forgotten about in Congo, recurrent typhoons still hitting the Philippines, and worsening violence against Christians in Nigeria, and on and on it goes around the world. And at this conference, that is, those of us who've been gathered uh, in a hotel at a conference on this issue, we're hearing different papers already today and tomorrow morning about different aspects of this Central Eastern European context and how the Bible relates to that. And of course, this also is a part of the world that has seen massive convulsions over these past hundred years or so. There was the geographical carve-up of the whole region after the First World War. There were the still potent rifts that were created by opposite sides during the Second World War, and almost a half a century of communist rule and domination in most of the region. And then after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, the influx of Western capitalism, cultural secularism, and all that followed with that. And then more recently, the rise of populism and authoritarian leaders in some countries and the response to the crisis of migration, and now, of course, the horrifying return to scenes that we thought we'd long forgotten from the First and Second World Wars in Ukraine. 
And meanwhile, in the global church, apart from the world out there, we see also bitter and painful splits, even in my own Anglican communion, and vitriolic dividedness among evangelicals in the United States and in other countries, and the very sad differences, to put it mildly, among Christians in this part of the world over what is happening in Ukraine. And then, of course, the dishonor to the Lord Jesus Christ of recurrent sexual abuse and other forms of scandal within the church itself. And behind all of that, there's the ominous darkening clouds of the chaos and extremes of the impacts of our climate change, which, according to the last intergovernmental panel, has become inevitable and irreversible. And one of the most depressing things I read in relation to that report was that all the achievements of the human race for the past 10,000 years, which would include all the civilization of biblical times and earlier, have happened in a global climate that is gone forever, no matter what the world leaders do uh, or don't do in the coming years. So it seems to me that what we're celebrating here today and in view of what we're celebrating here today and some of the papers that we're having at the conference we're attending, that rather than attempting to do any kind of words of wisdom or strategic response to any of these realities, I simply felt I should do what the CEBC itself does, which is to pick up the Bible and turn to the Bible in such times. And where should we turn in the Bible? Well, of course, there will be Psalms that could encourage us in such moments. There are promises that we might want to cling on to from the Lord Jesus Christ and his predictions. And there are the words of the apostles, of course, that uh, Taya was referring to earlier. But it did seem to me that the small book of Habakkuk speaks to us afresh in just such a time as this. And so I decided in the end simply to let Habakkuk speak in the context both of the joy and the soberness of an occasion like this. Because, as I'm sure we're all aware, the prophet Habakkuk also lived in a pretty terrifying time in history in which some pretty searching questions were being asked, were being asked by him and by any believer. Because not unlike our context, his context too was full of idols, in his own country, the country of Judah, there were the idols of injustice and shameless political lying in their politics and society of his country. And in the wider world of Assyria and Babylon, in the international world, there were the idols of military power, brutality, violence that were dominating that world. It was a world not very different from ours. So what can we learn from Habakkuk and about how we should live? How can we as it were, contextualize at least something from that book into where we are today. And I have to say, I've not yet read the commentary on Habakkuk in this book, because we haven't got our hands on it yet. Well, I want to suggest, as briefly as I can, five things from Habakkuk's short three chapters about what kind of people we should be. What is a word from the Lord into our context? I said I will suggest, first of all, that we need to be, like Habakkuk, a people who look for God at work in the world. In chapter 1 of Habakkuk, Habakkuk wants to see God in action. He cries out to God to listen and to do something about the evils that he sees around him. He, he pleads with God to explain what's going on. Why is God doing nothing when he says, for example, in his opening words, how long, Lord, must I call for help and you don't listen? I cry out to you, violence, but you don't save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There's strife and there's conflict. The law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. Doesn't that sound just like the world today? But God answers him almost immediately, look wider. Look at the nations, says God in verses 5 and 6. I am already present and active. I am at work. I quote from verses 5 and 6. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed because I'm going to do something in your day that you'd not even believe, even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylonians. 
Now, that phrase, I am going to do something, in our NIV, is literally in Hebrew, I am working a work. God is there, he says to Habakkuk. I am there, and God is at work. But, of course, God's answer to Habakkuk's first complaint seems to make things even worse because he says he's raising up the Babylonians to punish Judah. And Habakkuk knows the kind of people that the Babylonians are. If they're going to attack his country, it's going to be catastrophic. And he says so a little bit later. But, you see, having asked the question, he now at least knows and discerns that God is there and God is active and God is sovereign. So it's still pretty scary, but at least it's in God's hands. And so like Habakkuk, I think we need to encourage and to pray for discernment, to know and to trust that God remains sovereign in the world of history and of nature, and to listen to the news bulletins or read our papers with that perspective in mind. God says, look at the nations and watch. Watch out for God at work. And sometimes be pretty amazed. At the height of the war in Syria, of course, it's still going on to some degree, but at the height of it back about 10 years ago, I wrote to our good friend Riyad Cassis, who known to many of you, he's the director for the Langham Scholar Program and himself a Langham Scholar living in Lebanon. And I wrote to him to ask, because I was having to preach about the sovereignty of God from Micah, and I was wondering, how do you discern God in the midst of all that's happening just in Lebanon and in Syria at the time? And I, I wrote this, this is a little paragraph from my email to him. I said, might it be that we will look back on the Arab Spring and its horrible aftermath in, say, 50 years' time, in the same way that we now look back at the communist atrocities in China in the 1940s and 50s, which expelled all the Christian missionaries. But we can see the hand of God in that region now, back then, from 50 years ago. This is the email I got back from Riyadh, slight rebuke. He said, I believe that we as Arab Christians will not need to wait for 50 years to see that God is at work uh, through what he is doing marvelous things by then. What is actually taking place in the Middle East and North Africa in the midst of the tragedies of the so-called Arab Spring is really beyond belief. Let me give you some examples. There has never been a serious attempt to reach out to Muslims who lived in the strict and fundamentalist areas of Syria. That was impossible to take place by Syrian Christians due to many religious and political factors. But now with over one million refugees, most of them coming from those very same areas, the church in Lebanon has been able to reach out to them with the gospel message, along, of course, with a huge amount of humanitarian relief. And he goes on, not a long time ago, I preached at a Baptist church in my own hometown, that's in northern Lebanon, where 80% of the audience were Muslims from Syria, and perhaps 30% of them had already committed their lives to Christ. A mother of six children who is a graduate of Sharia law from Damascus University and now a refugee in Lebanon said to my wife, quote, the most amazing thing that happened to us was not escaping from death and destruction near Damascus, but through finding the Messiah Jesus who has changed our minds and our hearts, end of quote from Riyadh. I was amazed to receive that email and it answered my questions. And of course, I'm still now constantly amazed at hearing from our good friends in Ukraine at how God is at work there, even in the midst of such appalling evil, through seminaries and churches and pastors and ordinary believers who are reaching out with incredible courage and perseverance in the midst of those things. Be utterly amazed, said God to Habakkuk, and says it to us today. As Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Which, of course, doesn't make evil any less evil, or those who perpetrate it any less guilty and accountable before the judgment seat of God. But it does call us to remember that God has the power to bring the most surprising good out of the worst that human and satanic evil can do. And, of course, the cross is the ultimate example, the supreme example of exactly that. And that means then coming then on from seeing God at work to Habakkuk chapter 2, where therefore we must live, secondly, as people who live by faith. 
The famous words of Habakkuk 2 verse 4, the righteous person will live by faith. Famous mainly because it's quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1. But of course, God wasn't talking to Habakkuk just about saving faith, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for our justification. No, those who have come into that right relationship with God through faith, and in New Testament terms, through faith in Christ, must continue to live by faith. That is, by faithful trust and obedience to God, even in the midst of the evils of our world. Trusting that God will, in the end, put all things right, and believing that. Because you see, where Habakkuk 2 goes on from that verse, the righteous will live by faith, is that God assures Habakkuk that God will ultimately deal with the wicked, including all of the wickedness and idolatries of his own world at that time. Now, when you read the rest of chapter 2, which of course I, I won't take time to do, but you'll see there that the original target of his words was the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar at the time. But the list of offenses for which God is going to bring judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon is amazingly modern. There are five woes in chapter 2 of Habakkuk, and they sound very familiar. They are evils that pollute our contexts in multiple ways today. For example, there's the piling up of wealth through extortion and theft from other nations. There is building security for oneself while impoverishing others in verses 9 to 11. There is building cities on the foundation of bloodshed and slavery in verses 12 and 13. There is the effort to humiliate enemies and destroy God's creation, the forests of Lebanon and the animals and the land in verse 17. And all of these are, in a sense, instantiations of the fundamental human idolatry, the rejection of the living God. So much of what is there in Habakkuk is echoed in Romans chapter 1. And against all of this, you see, God pronounces woe, which is not just uh-oh, oh dear, or anything. That's a serious word of curse, saying that God will ultimately call such behavior to account. God will judge the earth and its peoples with equity and with justice, as Psalms 96 and 98 say. And we might not know how or when, but as Abraham reminded God, the judge of all the earth will do right, either within history, in his acts of judgment and pulling down the wicked sometimes from their thrones, or if not in history, then ultimately at the great final rectification of all things, when God will deal with all wrongs and put all things right before he makes all things new in the new creation. And then indeed, as that chapter also says in Habakkuk 2, then indeed the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Trust me, says God. Go on living by faith. Faith in the sovereign justice of God as well as the sovereign grace of God. So that's a real challenge to us in these days, I believe. And yet, it is an essential part, surely, isn't it, of what righteousness means. It means having a right relationship with God that is based upon God's grace and God's salvation, yes, but that is also lived out in humble trust and obedience and faithfulness and trust in God's ultimate judgment. And that includes our faithfulness to our callings, whatever they may be, in theological education, in church leadership, in pastoring, in preaching, the righteous will live by faith, going on trusting in the ultimate justice and truth of God. But of course, even as we do that, go on living by faith, we still have to go on living in this world with all its idolatry and its injustice, and we can't be immune or insensitive to all that suffering that's going on around us. So that's why I think, thirdly, Habakkuk urges us to live as people whose prayer includes lament and protest. Because, you see, Habakkuk stands among many, actually, in the Bible, including many, of course, in the book of Psalms, but also like Jeremiah and others, who cry out to God in lament and protest 
at the evil that they see all around them. But do we? Yes, I know that in some churches at least, uh, certainly in Anglican churches that I belong to, we regularly include prayers for the government, uh, for the president, the prime minister, whatever it is, and so we should. Uh, We are instructed to do so by the Apostle Paul. They need God's wisdom, they need God's strength, and of course they need the gospel too. So yes, we can indeed pray for our rulers Pray that they will come to repentance and salvation, have a meaningful encounter with the gospel and with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do justice in the meantime while that happens or whether or not it happens. So we pray for our rulers, but do we ever pray against them? I believe it's not contradictory to do both. I do both. For that is surely what the Psalms do when those in authority, those who are entrusted by God, with leadership in society, when they perpetuate injustice and lies and suffering and poverty. Psalm 10, arise, Lord, lift up your hand, O God. Don't forget the helpless. The victims commit themselves to you. Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness. Psalm 10, do not grant the wicked their desires, Lord. Don't let their plans succeed. Psalm 140, Help, Lord, nobody's faithful anymore. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. Everyone tells lies to their neighbors. They flatter with their lips, but they deceive in their hearts. May the Lord silence all flattering lips and boastful tongues. And because the poor are plundered and the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. Psalm 12. See, the Psalms are full of prayers like that. But do we ever hear them in our churches? I certainly haven't. Well, in one church I do, I have, but very rarely. Well, but surely this is what it means to pray the Lord's Prayer when we say those words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. If that's what it means, it means we need to pray something like what the Psalms prayed for God's will to be done. And surely one thing that recent events such as the COVID pandemic and then this war in Ukraine and the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, one thing that they've driven us to is the need, the desperate need, and the power of biblical lament, for which God not only gives us words and even a whole book called Lamentations, but actually God joins us in that weeping as we were hearing in one of our papers this afternoon in Jeremiah 48, where God weeps and wails for the suffering under his judgment of Moab. So God is also the God of tears. And so we need that voice of grief, of suffering, and of protest against not just the devastation that our folly and abuse of creation have caused, but also the terrible inequalities, the injustices that have been exposed by it. Let us weep with those who weep. So, we look for God at work. We live by faith. We give space in our prayers for lament and protest. But then Habakkuk also challenges, fourthly, to live as those who know the story of God. That is, the story of the whole Bible, which is where my title came in. Because in Habakkuk chapter 3, which is a bit sort of odd when you read it because it's full of very vivid symbolic language. But what Habakkuk is doing there is he is rehearsing with all that poetic imagery some of the great episodes from the story of his own people Israel. He's rehearsing the mighty saving acts of God in their past. And although the language is very picturesque and very symbolic, it's really just one of the ways in which the Israelites recall their history as they do in some of the Psalms. In other words, you see, Habakkuk knows the story he's in. It's the same story as the one that we now read, just as he would have done, through the Scriptures, the Scriptures that we call the Old Testament, but which he would have known simply as the Torah and some of the great traditions of, of the earlier period of his history. And so Habakkuk reminds himself of that story, in this great worship song, which is kind of what it is, and that gives him hope and faith, 
even in the midst of his anger and his fears. And so it should be for us that we need to draw hope not only from knowing, as it were, the story so far, that is, the story from the Bible up to the book of Acts, as it were, but also knowing where the story leads and where it will end when it takes us right through to the book of Revelation 21 and 22. So you see, this book of Habakkuk, and indeed the whole Bible, calls us to live by that other story, God's story. It's not a story that's separate from the world's story, but a story that absorbs and embraces and transcends the world's story on the ground, as it were, because it is the story of the redeeming mission of God that he promised to Abraham through Israel and the prophets, accomplished in the life, death, and resurrection of God's Son, Jesus, and to be completed when God brings all human history and all things in heaven and earth into reconciled unity in Christ in the new creation. See, that's the whole Bible story, and that's the true story, and that's our story. And the question is, are we living it? And are we bringing all the multiple stories of our own contexts into the critique and the light and, as it were, the presence of that biblical story so that it is embracing ours, not to suppress them, but to redeem them? The tragedy of the modern church, it seems to me, is our appalling neglect and ignorance of the Bible, especially among evangelical Christians who ought to know better. It's because we've sort of lost the plot, have lost this sense of the Bible being the story that we're in, that we're so susceptible to idolatry. And I mean us as Christians, not just the idolatry of the world, of course, but when those who are the people of the living God go after the gods of the people around them, as Deuteronomy and the prophets accused the Israelites of, then that's all the gods of national and political ideologies, of nationalism, of ethnocentricity, of arrogance and exclusion and everything else. They're all there. And when Christians submit to those things, it's partly because we're not living in the story of the whole Bible. We need to know the story that we're in and that we belong to, of the God we worship, the creator, the redeemer, and the ultimate judge of all the earth, the living God through his living word. And that's, of course, what makes this event so deeply meaningful and so filled with hope, because here we have this one volume of commentary on the whole Bible which is surely an encouragement to those who will take it up, who will get to know their Bible, who will learn to live within that great Bible narrative with faith and hope and joy of knowing where it all comes to an end, and then apply that story to their own lives, or rather, apply their own lives into that story. And that leads me then, finally, to the last verses of Habakkuk, which inspire us to live as people who are still on mission for God. Because you see, at the end of Habakkuk chapter 3, he finishes his book not in some kind of Bob Marley sort of mood, you know, don't worry about a thing because every little thing's going to be all right. You know, it's not that sort of don't worry, don't panic. No, in fact, Habakkuk tells us that he's still terrified, even at the end of his book, by what is lying ahead for his country. Just look at the catalog of deprivation that he portrays in chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. He says, I heard, in other words, I heard what was going to happen, and my heart pounded, my lips quivered, decay crept into my bones, my legs trembled. He can hardly even stand up for fear. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. He knows God's judgment will come. So even though the fig tree doesn't bud and no grapes in the vine, the olive crops fail, the fields produce no food, no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, in other words, nothing, it's all gone. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord and be joyful in God my Savior. It's an incredible balance of fear and faith. But here's my point. Even as he faces this prospect of a world under the judgment of God and all that it's going to inflict on his mission, he remembers, on his people, he remembers his mission because he still quotes Habakkuk the prophet. That's how he describes himself in his opening introduction. And that's his calling, that's his task. And so his last words in the book are these, the sovereign Lord is my strength. 
He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the high places, the heights. In other words, he's not going to just sit back and wait for God to intervene, even though he trusts that God ultimately will. No, he will run into action like a deer. His ministry as a prophet will go on in God's strength, because the heights means the places of idolatrous worship of Baal and all that went with it. And prophets like Habakkuk and the others, they constantly spoke up against that idolatry and all its horrendous social consequences in their nation. And so Habakkuk is going to be treading down those high places. That's his prophetic calling to expose and to oppose all the idolatry that produced so much violence and injustice and suffering and to call people to repentance which is the prophetic task. And Habakkuk plans to get on with that, with all the energy and determination and strength of his sovereign Lord. His mission goes on. That's actually one of the phrases that challenges me most from the intensely moving reports that some of us get pretty well daily from our good friends in Ukraine. One of them regularly ends, our mission is unchanged. Our mission goes on. That's the language of Habakkuk. That's the faith and determination of that prophet. So what's our mission? What's yours? We still live in this frightening, violent, unpredictable world. And in that sense, not much has changed since the days of Habakkuk. But in that world, we are still called to be the people of God, to be churches and believers of discernment, of faith, of prayer, of scripture, and of holistic missional engagement in word and deed. And so may we indeed respond with obedience, the obedience of faith, as Paul puts it, knowing that the God of Habakkuk, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is with us, and that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And so this wonderful occasion in which we rightfully celebrate, of course we do, may the words that Augustine heard also be spoken over the CEBC, tole lege, take up and read. And may those who do so join Habakkuk in being people who watch for God at work in his world, who go on living by faith, who are not afraid to weep and to lament, who know the story that they're in, the story of the whole Bible, and who then persevere in the mission that God has given to all his people until he returns. Amen.